Well, I was living in Alice Springs, and Tracy actually wanted Rosalie Kunoff Monks, who played Jedda, okay. to do this role. And I'll, I should tell you why she wanted her, first of all. So, uh, uh, Jedda, it was made in 1955. Yes. First um, colour film in Australian history. And uh, so Charles Chevelle, the director, went to the St Mary's home for half-castes in Alice Springs mm -hmm. to find the girl to play Jeddah in his 1955 film. And so the superintendent lined up all the girls and uh, he went along the line and picked out Rosalie Kunoth Monks. Well, as she's called now, her name back then was Rosalie Kunoth. So uh, she was um, looked after by Charles Chevelle and his wife, um, played the part. Um, and what you didn't say in your introduction is actually quite, I think, relevant to this. Yep. In the film, she's, in, she's playing the piano, yeah, which is you know, very much the, the Australian um, symbol of um, civilization and domesticity because all the women from England had to have a piano. So the homesteads had pianos. And I think it is it Anne Summers or who who writes about the, the piano. No, it was the man, you know, the historian. Writes about the piano as the symbol of domesticity for yep. the white woman on the frontier. Yep. Anyway, so um, she's playing the piano and out in the you know, the darkness. Um, what's the character's name? Marbuck. 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 This handsome young Aboriginal man who's wild, you see, um, is, is ensorcelling her. And so she goes crazy on the piano and then she runs away. Well, you know, you're led to assume that she runs away and joins Marbuck in the bush. And, of course, you know, the... The, the mythology in the film is that, you know, it's a forbidden relationship. Mm. Um, and uh, at the end of Jeddah, they both go over the cliff at the Catherine Gorge and commit suicide. Spoiler um, yeah. right? um, <laughs> yeah. So what Tracy's done here is bring Jeddah back to life as if none of that ap ever happened and she didn't, in fact, you know, succumb to Marbuck's sorcery mm. and she's stuck in the homestead for the rest of her life. So, which fate is worse? But anyway, um, um, so she really wanted Rosalie Kunoth Monks. So I had an old car, and I my I was driving her around Alice Springs trying to find Rosalie Kunoth. Oh, okay. And we, we ended up um, <clears throat> hearing that she was in the supermarket in the middle of town. So I pulled into the car park there, and I waited in the car. She came out all grumpy. I said, did you see her? She said, yes. So she wouldn't do it. No, she wouldn't do it. Mm, fair enough. Um, so Rosalie refused to play the, this part. And um, <clears throat> so I thought for a minute, and, you know, all the time that I'd been driving her around town, I was thinking, ask me, ask me, <laughs> ask me. And <laughs> so then I said to her, do you think I could play the role? Uh -huh. No, no, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. Anyway, later on, she, you know, agreed that I could play the role. Right. <laughs> and um, so I flew down to Sydney. It was all made in the uh, one of the studios at the Australian Film, Television, and Radio School. Mm. You know, next to Macquarie University, as it was then. And um, my. Uh, my baby, Ruby, was six weeks old, mm -hmm. and Ruby actually did the first audition for The Crying the Baby, crying. but of course <laughs> my Ruby goes, wah, wah, and it wasn't the right crying. Um, so somebody, you know, yeah. another kid did the crying. And, uh, with the credit there. It's, yeah, with yeah. the credit, yeah, the yeah. babies were credited. Um, and as the director, Tracy, was saying to me, 
I want you to look like Elizabeth Taylor in uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, okay? You have to look like Elizabeth Taylor. That's interesting, um, yeah. So, you know, my hair and my makeup is Elizabeth is, Taylor in yeah. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So what you need to know about Tracy is that uh, when she was in art school, and I think, you know, throughout her youth, she endlessly watched Hollywood movies. Mm. She had a thing for Hollywood movies. And, uh, um, and you know, today, um, well, there was a series that she made with uh, Gary Hill. He was the editor. She takes just under 10 second mm. um, segments out of Hollywood films and then gets Gary Hill to splice them together. Have you ever seen those? I've seen what about back chat. Is it called back chat or uh, something slap? like that? Slap. That's slap. Slap. Yeah, yeah. So slap is oh, <clears> yeah. just lots and lots of the Hollywood moments, Hollywood film moments of women slapping men. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another another one, I've forgotten what it's called, and it's women shooting men. Oh, this one called Other. Other, yeah, yeah Other. And it's all the um, the primitive native scenes, yeah. you know, ooga booga, ooga booga, ooga booga, ooga booga, yeah. <laughs> Zulu, there's something from, you know, Zulu in it. And it's just, you know, relentless. And, and I think women, you know, the movie star, starlet screaming and, yeah. you know, oh yeah, in, what, in King Kong, she's been carried away, you know, to be yeah. sacrificed in King Kong. So it's just nine second mm. clips of all of those, those films. Um, and then uh, I, uh, I think it's called Disaster. And it's nine seconds repeatedly of floods, earthquakes, you know, buildings falling down. So there was a, a series of those mm. and now it, at Venice she's got uh, another one um, and it's um, the photographs of the, uh, <clears throat> the refugees arriving or bits of film of the refugees arriving off the shores, north, northern shores of Australia mm. and they're kind of slightly animated and then they're cut up with um, pictures of um, movie stars in Hollywood films looking through blinds in yeah. horror or looking through oh, the yeah. binoculars in horror or looking out the porthole in horror, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so that is uh, the, this obsession with Hollywood you'll mm -hmm. see appearing in a lot of her work. Mm -hmm. And so um, you've got the, the quote from Picnic, um, you've got me made up to look like... Um, Mad Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor yeah. in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. That's you know, driven mad nice. in the heat and, yeah. uh, you know, the kind of the southern homestead. Yes. Um, and, um, yeah. So, because uh, I was struck knowing that you were here watching it, uh, what a talented actor you are. And I'm not just saying this to suck up. It's, it's a really, very good, uh, it's a very good performance. Well, I was had, in... Had you acted here? Tell, tell me about Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. in Black Theatre in Redfern. Okay. And I'd done, you know, some acting classes. I'd uh, uh, studied mime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I did the classical acting training where you sure. learn to throw your voice and, you know, breathe from your stomach. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> so have you done stuff since? Yeah, a bit, yeah. Okay. Usually as a cameo, uh -huh. because I get nagged into it um, <laughs> by by young filmmakers. Yes. They want you know they want me as the cameo. Yes. So yeah, I've done a little bit. Yeah, okay. but uh, um, so I was in a TV um, show called Pig and a Poke okay. with Brian Siren, uh, made in Redfern. Mm -hmm. I was in Here Comes the Nigger at the Old Black Theatre, mm -hmm. and you know a few other things like that. Okay, well that's another string to yeah. And then I but you know on. later I moved to Alice Springs. But when I was in Alice Springs, I was in the Thespian Separatists. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we did a musical, that, you know, in the old shed by the river. Right. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention Jimmy Little uh, in my introduction. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on his appearance in this film? Um, did you know he was involved? Did you meet him while you were... Because he would have been shot separately. He was shot separately, yeah. but I knew that he was involved. Mm -hmm. um, well... Let's just go back a step. Sure. What the audience may not know mm -hmm. is that, <clears throat> okay, so Jeddah um, in the 1955 film, the character Jeddah mm. in Chavelle's 1955 film, is a little Aboriginal girl who's being brought up by 
you know, the homesteaders mm -hmm. in the homestead and she wears a pretty dress and she plays the piano. So she is being assimilated and this is the romantic vision of what assimilation looks like on the frontier. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really nice. She's wearing a pretty dress. She's learning to play the piano. Of course, the reality is, you know, absolutely brutal and horrifying, mm. right? Mm. It basically, it's a lie. I don't think Chavelle understood that. I don't think he had mm. any clue. I mm. don't think he was a city liberal. Yep. Um, he fell for the the myth. Yeah. He recreated the myth, and then, of course, every Christmas in Australia. For years afterwards, Jeddah is shown on mm. television along with, you know, a bit of spring starring Chips Rafferty. Mm. Mm. Um, and, you know, these mythologies about Aboriginal people are, mm. you know, propagandised through television. Mm. Um, in this Night Cries, of course, Tracy grew up with a, a foster mother, mm. you know, a non-Aboriginal foster mother in Mount Gravatt in Brisbane. Um, in, in, in Night Cries, I think she does a number of things. She, um, well, you know, I mean, obviously she shows the trauma, mm. uh, that, you know, children who were removed from their Aboriginal parents suffer. Yep. You know, clearly yeah. that's front yeah. and centre of, yes. of what it's all about. What happens to the, bro the two little boys? Yeah. They just, they can't, they appear and then they disappear. Yeah. Right? Mm. Um, so what happens to them? Yeah. And that's what happened to so many people, you know, siblings were split up. Mm. They never saw their siblings again or, you know, mm. they might have found them in their adulthood, but that, um, you know, missing, it's not just about being removed from your parents, you're also removed from your siblings, mm. right? Um, so there's all of that trauma. Mm. And then, um, the second thing is, it's like, you know, people get um, puppy dogs at Christmas time as gifts and then after Christmas they don't want them and they, you know, try to drown them and they dump them on the RSPCA and there's always hundreds of puppy dogs and pussy cats after Christmas when mm -hmm. everyone's sick of them. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to these Aboriginal kids. Mm -hmm. If they weren't used as, you know, basically slaves or domestic servants, um, people got sick of them and they were shifted from foster home to foster home. But in bringing Jedda back to life, you know, the, mm. the fictional character Jedda, she doesn't go over the cliff with Marbuck. What happens then? Well, what if she's stuck at the homestead for the rest of her life and the foster mother becomes very old and she's stuck there looking after the foster mother? She has no life except basically as a domestic servant, mm. Mm. right? Um, is there an affection for the mother? Quite possibly, mm. right? But it's a, you know, it's a conflicted mm. relationship. Um, so you can see again, you know, she's exposing the nature of that relationship between the child that's been removed from the Aboriginal family and placed in a, a white foster home. Mm. Is the, you know, relationship with the people in the white foster home ever <coughs> the same as, you know, with the biological family? There's a great deal of conflict. Mm. Um, and also, you know, you can see very clearly that what she's done with the romantic homestead from Jeddah is, right, bring it forward into the future. What does the homestead look like now? Well, yes. the, the, the romantic myth has completely yes. disappeared, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the fly screen's ripped and... Um, um, Everything's kind of falling yeah, to pieces. Yeah, you know, yeah. I there's no refrigerator. They're eating canned food, yeah. you know. I guess, because uh, um, I guess one of the other striking things about the Chevelle film is uh, its technical inadequacies are very striking at various points. One of which is the the, the transition between shots shot in the studio and shots sort of shot outdoors in the outback, and it's sort of you can see this big wrench. And in a sense, you could see Moffat um, reading those technical technical inadequacies for the meanings that emerge in the kind of cracks of the film. And I, I particularly like the way that there is there is no outside in this film. The whole you go out into what's supposed to be the authentic bush, and you're actually still still in a kind of uh, yeah. in culture and landscape. Yeah. As well. I don't know if you remember at the beginning of Jeddah, <clears throat> there's a series of helicopter shots yes. and landscape shots. Yeah. 
and and they're not of any one place. Yes. You know, there's a bit from the Catherine Gorge, there's yeah. a bit from Central Australia, there's yeah. a bit from Arnhem Land, there's a bit from the, you know, yeah. West Arnhem wetlands, and they're all just kind of, you know, pastiche together yeah. as if, you know, the bush. this is Australia. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, you know, they're thousands of miles apart, yeah. you know. Um, and so it's all that fakery and yes. I, you know if you watch the film now I you know I stupidly sit there and think where's it set is it set outside oh, of yeah. Catherine yeah. it doesn't matter no. you know it's just set in the you know yeah. um, the never never absolutely you know <laughs> after the novel we of the never never right who wrote that oh that is what Anus Gunn Mrs. Mrs. Anus right. Gunn yeah. Mrs. Uh, Anais Gunn we yeah. of the never never yeah so she was a young wife, goes to the, you know, mm. to join her husband on the, you know, outback cattle station. Mm. Um, it's actually, um, it is just south of Catherine, actually. It's just south of Mataranka. I um, can't remember what it's called now, but anyway. Um, I, I certainly, um, uh, I've been quite influenced actually by another talk that you gave, Marsha, in 2009 at King's. Uh, really kind of redirecting um, our attention away from, not to ignore, but away from the recovery of so-called, uh, you know, the elders' traditional knowledge towards uh, Aboriginal youth. And it made me uh, look back at Jeddah and really focus on Jo, uh, the, who is the... So Jeddah is disrupted in her love interest by Marbuck. But she's presented as being mm -hmm. uh, lined up to marry uh, another half caste um, uh, young man. This is all very racist language. Yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. So, but uh, we're presenting it in the language of the day. We are. Right? So. You know, uh, it's racial miscegenation theory, okay? Yes. Yeah, and I guess, and so uh, Joe is presented as a son of a, a, a son of a. Afghan camel herder and a local Aborigine woman, I think is the yeah. name, isn't it? And, but, uh, there are lots a, of families like that. Yes, in the there are, yeah. 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 But he, he's being lined up to become head stockman yeah. of, the, um, of the local, of the station. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he does become head stockman of the station. And so he's a, he's a very conflicted figure when we watch him now in 2017. And yet within Jeddah, there is also a story of somebody's kind of professional um, development. And to me, that and he is the one telling the story. He narrates Jeddah. He said, mm -hmm. this is my story, the story of Jeddah, the woman I loved. So to me, Jimmy Little kind of starting the piece, interrupting the piece, ending the piece, says, says that Moffat has really thought about Joe as well, mm -hmm. I think. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and I think also in this extraordinary performance by Jimmy, which is a completely professional performance, as is the film itself, a glossy, highly professional kind of uh, product. It's uh, we're, we're kind of ex we are in the process of watching it exposed to the trauma that lies underneath that kind of professional shell, which which nonetheless kind of shows the the achievements and the resilience of figures like that in dealing with their trauma, but still making something of themselves. Does that make does that make any sense, or does that just sound crazy? I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm thinking that the the sheer professionalism of the look of Night Cries is actually part of its message, and that it has a kind of glossy Hollywood look about it. But uh, that I always I thought, to... I can see what you're getting at. Mm. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I'd always thought of Jimmy Little being in Night Cries as. Uh, a way of bringing in um, the sound of that ideology yeah. of assimilation. Mm -hmm. Because his hit song, Telephone to Jesus, um, probably became a hit, I don't know, I was in grade four or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 1956, mm -hmm. 1955, 1956, that's when that song became a big hit mm -hmm. in Australia. And it was, you know, played on the radio. Yeah. Um, and so he and, you know, the jockey Darby McCarthy and um, Harold Blair, the opera singer, and, and a few other characters were the, you know, the ideal yes. of the successfully assimilated Aborigines. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, 
the whole business of removing children, tens of thousands of children from yes. their families, um, was conducted under, uh, you know, the ages of Christianity and, mm. um, you know, how do we get rid of this, you know, inferior race mm. and we'll save the children, mm. we'll, we'll put them into nice white homes and, uh, you know, they created an absolute disaster by doing so. Mm. But, you know, the, the missions and the missionaries and Christian families played a big role mm. in this, this whole exercise. So I always thought that he was, you know, a, a kind of iconic image mm. of that history for Tracy. But mm. one can never tell. Tracy never says anything, right? Yes. So yeah. you could be right, I could be right. Well, I think, I, think, I think both readings hold it. I, I'm very interested in the way that we see Jimmy preparing for his performance. So yes. he slings the thing yep. over and you see his hands and he kind of becomes Jimmy Little yep. at various points. And, yep. um, and obviously there's that sense of, is this a assimilated character that is presented as sort of suffering through through the presentation of his assimilation, or is it a professional performer able to deploy the iconography of assimilation to have some kind of a career? And I think we're left with that in a dubious state, maybe. But um, Well, I think Moffat plays games. Of course, She yeah. plays psychological games. Yes. Right, I mean, how can you disrespect Jimmy Little? Yes, you know? exactly, yes, yeah. Um, so is she being disrespectful? Yeah. I don't think so. Right. But at the same time, you know, she is being clinical Tracy Moffat and, you know, using him in some role in yeah. her, you know, little horror story there, isn't she? Yeah, the ruthless you know? artist, actually. Isn't it? No? The ruthless artist. The ruthless artist. artist. She is the ruthless she artist, says. yes. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if... Can we ask people for questions? Yeah. So, so I, I, I would be very interested in anybody else's. We've got a fantastic audience here, a very informed one. I can see um, some wonderful people here. Would, you, uh, would somebody people like to comment or ask a question? Deadly silence. Mm -hmm. Maybe a comment on the outhouse as a, it's the primary structure. It was the entirely Sorry? Yeah. Well, you know, I've often wondered about that, and the only thing I can think of is, uh, well, you know how we're led to believe that the the um, these homesteaders on the cattle stations uh, are doing well. Yeah. I, and you know, I've been to some of these cattle stations. They live in. They live like that, mm. right? They're not doing well. Mm. They in in many, especially in these areas where the it's very marginal cattle country. You know, uh, I mean, there are places like that in Central Australia, and there's some mad old man with his shotgun and fifty goats. Mm. You know, that's that's what it is. And there are places in Cape York like that. And I've been to them and, I, you know, it's been a real shock to me because you have this idea of, you know, the Barnaby Joyce character yes. or the Bob, Bob Catter character with the big hat yeah. and, you know, um, <clears throat> with thousands of acres and yeah. big cattle herds. Many of them are dirt poor farmers who live in hovels like this, mm. right? Or, well, graziers who live in hovels like that. And you, you notice that, you know, in the film, um, there's, there's canned food. Mm. And an outhouse, so there's no electricity, there's no, uh, you know, sewage or, mm. you know, facilities and so on. So it's, you know, the horror of the homestead brought into the present day and there are places like that, mm. you know. So, like you know, and, you know, if you think about it, the, the, the reason for removing children was that, you know, Aborigines were really primitive and they lived in really filthy conditions well, this is what these white people lived like. And they were removing children from circumstances no better than that, but this is a white fellow's house. Mm. That's how I think about that. Mm. I think that, I mean, the metal on metal is a really recurring motif, and the metal on flesh with the um, kind of prosthetic arm that we see at the start. And 
I won't try and interpret that, but I, but obviously it's shut. It, the whole thing is in that nightmarish mode where everything is overdetermined, and you can think. And I've never found any aspect of this film which isn't worth thinking about. You know, and, and the out, I've never tried to think about the outhouse. But you're perfectly right. It's the only kind of built thing that you see in its entirety, and you actually spend quite a bit of the film waiting outside it. And she's actually, washing by hand washing, on the old yeah, scrubbing board. Yeah. There's no. You know, there isn't even a hand washing machine. You know, there's a lot of washing of the the child Jeddah and Jeddah too, trying to get get the black skin off effectively. You know, it's uh, all constantly being washed. The dummy. Sorry. The dummy. Yeah, oh, the, the dummy. dummy yeah. yeah. The dummy is so central. I think. So central. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is the word for it, and it's very very central. Yeah, that's true. It's not just bush culture. It was only a generation ago that it was in inner city. Yeah, you know, of course. The, you know, yeah. Yeah. even inner city Sydney. You know, Brunswick. Right. The laneways yeah. in Brunswick. The structures are still all there in the terrace houses yeah. that are really uh, gentrified now. You know, mm. they're, they're sheds now, but they're, it's not that long ago. There's something about the decay of being a human. I grew up as a child, child in the bush. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, you had torn up newspaper. Oh, uh, yeah, the old torn up newspaper. Yeah. Dad had to dig the hole every week. It's so hot. Yeah. And there's a child going out at night in the dark. It's a very, it's a very scary place. That's true. So that the noise also of that door clanging. Yes. And, and the silence in the bush. Is, yeah. So I think you're really, to, to me, it was one of the loveliest things about the yeah. film was that being the central. Yeah, fascinating. Um, piece of, of, of set, you know, the setting. To be, I mean, Alan Bennett says when people say I had to do everything for her, uh, they're always saying there was one particular thing that they're actually having to do for her, which is, of course, deal with the, the toileting of, a, of an aged parent. So to me, it also brings out that yeah. kind of level of the abject care, if you like, yeah. that, um, uh, that, that Jedi or, or the figure you're playing has been reduced to. Yeah. I'm just curious, Marcia, because um, it's 28 years old, 1989, yeah. and it looks as fresh as a daisy, you know, it just yes. is so strong. So I wondered if, if you could take yourself back to when you first saw it and what your feelings were, you know, you've probably seen it many times, but what do you think, compa comparing your feelings seeing it now and here in 2017? Well, you know, in 1989, it was before the um, inquiry into the removal of Aboriginal mm. children from the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their mm. families mm. by Sir Ronald Wilson and Mick Dodson for the Human Rights Commission. So it was before mm. the inquiry and it was still at that time when, you know, the victims themselves were starting to, you know, talk to each other and find out what happened. But the idea of, you know, what is now called the Stolen Generations was not a national issue. Mm -hmm. And it took quite some time for the inquiry to be conducted and for them to you know, deliver their report, which was delivered in, uh, I think, 1996? 97. 97. 97. 97. 20, 20 years this year. Yeah. 20 years this year, of course it is. Yeah. And delivered to the Howard government commission. Yeah, years. and John mm -hmm. Howard, who, who was the prime minister uh, of the parliament, when the report was tabled, absolutely refused to acknowledge that these children were stolen. He said they were rescued. Really? Yeah, so, you know, uh, so this film was made long before the stolen generations became a nationally understood issue, you know, and it was after the tabling of the report that you had the sorry day uh, marches and bridge crossings and, I don't know, Mm. people signing books in order to force an, an official apology from the government, which didn't come until Kevin Rudd gave the apology... 2006. 2006. Ten years so this ago. film predates that whole history. Sorry. And it was made James. before the realisation of the, you know, the horrors of that period yeah. had become understood. Um, and so... But, I mean, it, for us it, back then... You know, it's like, you know, remembering life before feminism. Yeah. You know, when there was no language. Yeah. 
you know, sexism wasn't a word, misogyny wasn't a word that we knew. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's it's so, you know, we just understood that something was wrong, but there was no language for it. So seeing this film for the first time, now looking back, is like that. There was no language for the horrors of that. Mm. You see what I mean? And in many ways, I might have regarded it as, you know, purely a reflection by Tracy on what must have happened to people like her. Mm. You know what I mean? I don't think this is biographical on Tracy's part. Um, but, you know, people to whom that had happened had started talking to each other, right? Um, and then watching it now is very different because I think now the film is even more powerful because if people see it now, they have that, you know, that history explained to them in the report and the many documentaries that have been made. This film was uh, chosen uh, for un certain regard at the, um, at the Cannes Film, film Festival. Um, so it was regarded as a major work and it's, you know, as soon as it was made. And, you know, now every, you know, fine arts student and cinema studies student has seen it, I guess, you know. I had the great pleasure of teaching it and I have taught it every year to students for about 14 years and so I've seen it many times and I, I, never, no. I never see it as old. It always has an extraordinary relevance to me, I think. It's just, it, it's grown in stature, actually. And it's more was, she more. Possibly, was she a young artist at the she time? Was very it's one of her first work, mm. major works. Yeah. It was her, well, it's not, what, 17 minutes long? Yeah. 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 Uh, she'd made a couple of films before this I can't even remember the name of them. Nice coloured nice girls. girls. Oh yes. And the devil. The devil. Yeah. No, the devil comes yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Um, Murichioga. Uh, Murichioga, strong women. Uh, and I think she also made a um, an anti-AIDS ad. Oh yeah. yes. Yeah. I'm not. Can't remember the sequence of events, but certainly nice coloured girls predates this. I think it says a lot. I mean, it says a lot to. Well, Moffat's sensitivity and her ruthlessness, but also just how embedded it is in the kind of culture of the time and indeed the kind of visual cultures. And that, that kind of Hollywood factor actually really uh, also gives it uh, uh, a quite a profound bit, I think. You compare it to Australia, which is also trying to kind of play the, the, the film by Baz Luhrmann, which is also trying to draw kind of Hollywood tropes into an Australian outback context. Yes. Uh, this, this is a, uh, anticipating that, but doing it in a um, in a quite a different, different style. Do we have any other? She was so you know so she was in her early twenties when yeah. she made yeah. this. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Um, did she tell you much about what to do? I mean, how much how much uh, of your action is it, Marsha? Do do you uh, did, was was is Tracy a kind of autocratic? Director? Oh, totally autocratic. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally autocratic. Okay. She had the entire thing storyboarded. Yes, okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, so what, but there must, there's a lot So of my part uh, took f four or five days to make in the studio. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. she's a, you know, a, an extreme perfectionist. But there's a lot to read in your face. I mean, how did you prepare to do the role? There were, you know, a few takes. Mm. Um, but has she shown you a storyboard of the whole thing? Or no. Yeah, okay. No. So she controlled. Oh, yeah, very controlled. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, there's almost nothing of, you know, of me trying to understand a character in this. Okay. I was directed. Yeah, I'm not, okay. I was, you know, a kind of a puppet. Uh, you might be underestimating your impact, but yes, yeah, so I'll take that. Yeah. No, but I didn't know what the story was. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Shot yeah, out of sequence yeah, yeah. and, you yeah. know. Okay. Um, if there's no others, um, yeah. you just told that story about casting, that the role that you eventually got. Do you know is how she cast your mother in it? Well, yeah, um, yeah, Agnes Hardwick, the late, well, she wouldn't be yeah. alive now. Um, she was a ripper. Um, <laughs> she lived in an, uh, an old people's home in Habersfield. And... Um, Casting agents looking for old people 
apparently went to this old people's home because all the old people signed up to be, you know, to be extras. And uh, because they, you know, they'd get some pocket money. And she was fantastic. You know, she'd put that thing on and she took her teeth out and, you know. Um, and I was really, really played the part. Yeah. And she was absolute sweetie. Yeah. Absolute sweetie. I noticed this time that it, it does cover 24 hours like Picnic does. Okay, so it's opening in the daytime and then comes around to the, um, the, the next day when the, uh, the woman is dead. So there's a kind of shaping there which is quite, um, quite amazing. I want to think about the... So, so the whole thing to me is like a night... It, it feels like a nightmare. But there is this nightmare sequence in the middle with the, uh, with the young, younger version of the white mother and the young version of, of your character, I presume, in the girl. You mentioned about the little boys disappearing. That's something I'd never um, kind of clocked before, if I think about that one. Uh, what, what do you make of that whole kind of sequence with the seaweed? To tell you the truth, I don't even like to think about it. Mm. You know, it's such... Imagine being able to concoct that yeah. as a nightmare. Yes. And what it represents. Yes. Yeah, so there's a ruthlessness about her own yeah. experience, isn't there, too? Well, yeah. you know, she does nightmare yeah. quite well, doesn't she? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, that intercutting reminds me of the worst nightmares I've... Uh, just, just the thought, not the subject of them, but the kind of the format of them, if you like. So it's a real sensitivity, I think, to the way whatever this is works. Um, there's an yeah. eroticism, though, with the mother being yes. away, you know, yeah. touching her... Um, you know, what she's thinking step. about yeah. her swimsuit, she's, you know, while the kids are playing, yeah. whatever they're doing, but, um, well, you know, so there's a strange mix of really strong emotions. Yes. But I, I sometimes wouldn't call it nightmare because it's uh, reality. Well, it's Tracy's reality. If absolutely. it is, I don't think it is. On it. I don't think, I don't think it is. Not reality, but, you know, something from her life yeah. has brought those images and ideas onto the screen for yeah. her as an artist. So, n nightmare is our daily lives. Yeah. Look at what we're living through now. Some of it is, so what, you know, nightmare. I, I reality. I certainly think she's interested in um, the ways in which the the realities of the psyche poke through into the interstices of your everyday life. So this is, so you know, you get the you get that younger mother kind of casually adjusting her um, bikini, or not bikini, a kind of a swimwear strap. Which looks like a kind of un it's a, it's a thing it's a kind of thing that you do without really I thinking it was about casual, it. I thought it was quite sexual. Well, well, it's, oh, well, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Actually, but, yeah. I wouldn't call it sexual. I'd call it feminine. Yeah. Really? Right. So. Real. Yeah. Look, the main characters are women. Yes. Yeah. So you know, it's kind of a a feminist, a feminist statement as well. So, I think she what she's doing there is you know really asking, you know, well, how would women do? Mm. What would women do in these circumstances? Mm. And, um, you know, the horrible thing about that nightmare, it, and remember, it is a, uh, a construct, yes. mm. right? Yes. So don't attribute it to her no, in some no, kind no, of no. simple biographical no, way. No, it is a construct. No, no. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, the, the, the young mother, yeah. right, is... Um, Essentially, she's childless. Yes. She doesn't have any white kids, mm. and she's got these three yeah. black kids. Mm. And she turns her back on them mm. and faces the sea. Mm. So I think it's a way of saying, well, what love for these children mm. could this white mother have? Is she also trying to play a role in the assimilationist mm. um, drama? Mm. And what must it be like for a young white mother to not actually have white kids but to end up with these black kids, right? Mm -hmm. So that's it's a good like question to ask, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. It's like the handmaid that we're all watching at the moment, Margaret Atwood, yeah. you know, there's people, women that aren't able to have children, so they bring in the handmaids. Yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's another it's layer. It's a very, yeah, because she is 
hasn't got her own children, which was probably her, her greatest, you know, greatest one what? of the things she wanted. Yeah. It's also, I mean, the, the I guess because I'm a film reader, not a film producer, and this is the greatest reading of Jenna that uh, that has ever could possibly be made. I always tell my students if you could submit that, you get 100. percent But um, but uh, it begins with the trauma of Sarah McCann, who has right. lost her white baby, right. and uh, and then there's the death of the Aboriginal mother, and there is a line by one of the young Aboriginal workers in it, it says white baby fly out, black baby fly in. So there's a kind of uh, transition there. Um, so you could read Jada as exploring Sarah yeah. McCann's trauma as well. However, weirdly, she drops out of the film halfway through. So as soon as Marbach has taken um, Jada, yeah. Sarah, as a character who's actually also been a quite central character, disappears altogether. So uh, thinking in, ter- in feminist terms about all of the relations of the women, um, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, is a really uh, interesting thing, I think. No, I'm yeah. just picking up on these these kind of questions about the way that um, both Jeddah and kind of Hollywood films have kind of influenced them, and talking about the kind of dream, the nightmare sequence. I don't know if you were there, so you may not know the answer to this question, but I've always been fascinated by it. At one point, it seems like the boys are throwing the seaweed, and then when there's the first shot of the girl on her own, it looks a lot like videotape, yes. actually, around yeah. the neck. Yeah. I think it's quite an interesting... I wasn't there when it was made, but yeah, I think you're right. <coughs> Um, sort of like being trapped in the movie. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's Moffat's kind of self-referential thing yeah. there. She does that. But it's, it's interesting that the baby's, that the girl is crying at the same yeah. time. So yeah. I wonder if there's there's something in there about the kind of because Tracy has such a kind of complex relationship with the kind of source material when she uses um, Hollywood and, and from in interviews when she talks about you know her experiences growing up and watching these films. So I just think there's something. Yeah. There's something that I haven't been able yeah. to quite work out yeah. about this kind of, you know, this traumatic, maybe it's a trauma of kind of watching, yeah. I don't know, whether something like maybe being black and but seeing all these films that are very much about white characters yeah. and the black characters are always pushed to the margins or I don't know. Well, actually, this is a film where you can think about that for a year. This is, this is what I love about this film. Why is there a celluloid or, or videotape uh, strangling the little girl? right at the moment when she looks over and the mother's gone. So there's a, the tableau effect is always significant. Um, one can never quite be certain what it is. But, um, I mean, I suppose in some ways, Marsha, she's, Jeda is a pretty heavy burden to carry as an artist <laughs> at, uh, if, if that is your, and I'm sure Moffat is recognizing this, that's also part of her own cultural heritage. She's got to wear Jeda like videotape strangling her neck at the same time as she brings Australian film into a new kind of um, space, I suppose. Um, she's a lot better filmmaker than Chevelle. I think that's what I'm thing. <laughs> okay, I'm getting a... Okay, so uh, I think that we have another extremely stimulating... Well, I hope ours are stimulating, but we know that we've got a very stimulating talk ahead. Um, Marsha Langton has been giving of her time throughout this festival. She gave a magnificent lecture at King's College London the other day. I know she is also speaking on Monday evening here at Ritz at 7.30 p.m., I think. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock to, give the, uh, to give the Origins lecture. Uh, I'll be there. I can't wait to hear more from her. So please join me in thanking Marsha Langton. Thank you.